Turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. I'm going to ask you to stand. Join me standing out of respect and reverence for the reading of God's word. When you find your place in Matthew, chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, this is where we'll start. The scripture reads, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret when your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray you help us to understand what you want us to see this morning. Fathers, we talk about serving you, Lord. That is also something that does not come easy. It comes easier for some than it does for others, but it is a sacrifice. I pray, Father, that you would help me, Lord, connect the dots today so that we as your children would know and understand what you desire from us. Father, help us to see what you want us to see. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you didn't come to Sunday school this morning, did we get a head count down there, John? You know how many was there? 22 people in Sunday school this morning was talking about fasting. And when, it come, when we're talking about fasting, what comes with fasting is uh, motive. Why do you fast? We have, to, you have to, we have to understand fasting, and I'm going to talk more about that next week. But you have to understand fasting. But when a person is fasting, you don't know a person's motive. When a person is praying, you don't know their motives. I've heard people say, if your head is bowed, it's not gossip. <laughs> Amen. I've heard it. What that means is when I share in the prayer meeting that help, you know, brother so-and-so because he's struggling with such and such, I'm just gossiping, and I'm praying out loud, and my head's bowed, and I'm hiding it. I'm masking it under the guise of praying. But you're gossiping. There's a big difference. So you really can't discern a person's motives. And when it comes to serving, the same is true. Look at verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. Somebody's translation read different. I'm looking for a synonym for acts of righteousness. Good deeds. Anybody else? Practicing your piety. I'm caught, we're talking about being holy. Holiness is a lifestyle set apart by God, set apart for God's purpose, for God's, just so God can use you. But piety is a little different, is it not? You're walking around, I mean, you're trying to show the world how pious you are, how holy you are. That's not the purpose of holiness. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. God doesn't honor that. You may fool a whole lot of people, but you'll never fool God. And God does not bless that. Verse 2 says, so when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. Hey, I put in $5,000 in the uh, uh, Salvation Army's bucket or whatever. You, and you're telling everybody that. You, you don't, there's no need for that. The, that's, that's the motive. We're getting back to motive. So... We're sitting here, we're talking, okay, we're talking about sacrifice, we're talking about serving, and I'm thinking motive. Why would I want to serve? Why would I want to serve God? Why would I want to sacrifice? Why? Well, I'm glad you asked. Go down to verse 19 with me, same chapter 6. The Bible says, do not store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. I was watching, uh, I was looking at my truck. Uh, I, I don't know, many of you know I have, I have a white pickup truck. It's a 1998 Ford F-150. Runs really good. It's got about 230,000 miles on it. it runs really good. Uh, but it's, I mean, it looks pretty good. You look at it, that's a pretty decent truck. It's not bad. <laughs> Well, I was looking at it yesterday. I pulled up in the car, I looked at it, and it, it, there's rust spots on it. There's rust all the way through. Right? I could see where there used to be a piece of steel there. It's gone. 
It's time. Time weathers the vehicle and the vehicle. I guarantee you when that truck drove off the lot, that thing looked pretty sharp. I mean, it was brand new when it was made. How many of you have a new car? Don't raise your hand. Don't, you know, I don't want people looking at you sideways. But if, how many of you had a new car that you drove off the lot and you're like, ooh, nobody's going to eat in this car because you don't want crumbs on the seat, right? Yeah. Dust your shoes off before you get inside, right? Take it to the car wash. You buy one of those packages where you can take the car to the car wash anytime you want all month long for like 30 bucks or whatever. Seems like a great deal until you do the math down the year, years down the road. That new car loses its new. You have to spray the new car smell into your car. You ever do that? Yeah. It's gone. The air pressure. You're spraying it in because the new car isn't new anymore. I've shared this with you before about my college degree. I wanted honors. I graduated with honors, and I missed the uh, uh, 4.0 by 0.2%. I graduated 3.98. I was furious because I wanted the 4.0. You know what? That was in uh, that was in 1990. What year was that? I don't know. 2004. Whatever it was. My point is, who cares? I don't. You ever want that promotion? You're chasing it, and then you get it, and you're like, eh. And has that ever happened to you? You wanted something so bad, and you get it, you're like, eh. If you can relate to that, can I hear an amen? That's because the treasures on earth don't last. They don't last. The new car, the promotion, whatever it is, fill in the blank. And if you have something you really treasure, you may lose it. Somebody may steal it. It may burn down in a fire, or whatever the case may be. You'll lose it in a crash, whatever. You forget it. At the restaurant, you left those $300 sunglasses or whatever, or that purse. Somebody steals it. I mean, that stuff happens. Well, how about that purse, lady? You get that purse, whoo, nice. But then until you see the next one, that one's not as nice. Dudes, we're the same way with the toys. We got, we got toys, too. The point is, the treasures on earth never last. They don't. You know why? Because the Bible says that God has placed eternity in the man's of heart, in the hearts of man. We desire to live forever, and all this temporary stuff doesn't matter because it doesn't last forever. So the Bible says don't store up treasures for yourself on earth where moths and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Now, how in the world do you do that? How do you store treasures in heaven? Well, you do it by serving God. That's how. There's songs we used to sing where a person goes to heaven and they meet somebody in heaven that that person says, man, I am here because one day you taught a Sunday school lesson it opened my eyes and opened my heart. Those are the treasures we're going to have in heaven. We're going to receive rewards in heaven for the things that we've done here on earth that have heavenly results. Storing up the treasures for ourselves down here isn't part of that. Look at, stay with me here. Where moths and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can tell what a person values. You can tell what a person treasures. They talk about it all the time. I shared this before. When I first met my wife, she was my girlfriend. I'd come home, and I would talk about Tina, 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 Tina. My sisters were like, oh, shut up. That's all I talked about. They got tired of hearing it. Any moment that I had, I wanted to go over to her house and hang out with her and her family. Every chance I got on the phone, she was like, <sighs> but I'm like, hey, how you doing? I wanted to talk to her. I wanted to spend time with her. I was pursuing my girlfriend at the time. I wanted to spend time with her. I wanted to, I was, I was investing things in her. I was buying her stuff, taking her places. Where your treasure is, where your heart is, there's your treasure. My heart was set on this woman, and I pursued this woman. Asked her mother for permission to take her to a concert and rented a limousine and everything else, and brought the flowers and did the whole nine yards, right, guys? Because I'm in pursuit of this person. Where a person's heart is, the scripture says, for where your treasure is, there's where your heart is. Amen? So we can say we love God all we want to, but if you got more football jerseys in your closet than you got Bibles, the NFL just may be your God. Drop down with me here. Let's keep reading here. Verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Eyes are the windows to the soul. Garbage in, garbage out. But if your eyes are bad, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light within you is darkness. How great is that darkness? Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. I entitled today's sermon, Serving in Excellence. 
No one can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, my translation says. Somebody's translation is different. Look. Read that again, Vern. Slaves of God? And of money? Can't be a slave to God and a slave to money. You can't, it can't be both. Anybody's translation read different. We're looking for a, a, something other than money. Because people hear this all, oh, they're checking out. Pastor's after the money. No, I'm not after your money. I really, I mean, the money is just part of the problem. It's part of the problem. The money is connected to the heart. You think I'm kidding? I just told you I spent all my money and all my time on the girl that I was love, in love with and I was pursuing. If you love the Chicago Bears, you probably, have, you probably have Chicago Bears memorabilia. If you love sewing, you probably have a sewing machine and sewing stuff at home. If you love uh, cars, you probably have a cars and car stuff. If you love cooking, you probably have baking goods and stuff at your house. You're going to invest in the things that are important to you. So money's just part of the problem. It's a heart issue. You cannot be slaves to both God and of money. Does anybody have the, the word mammon? Thank you. Somebody want to dig that the, the definition up for me? One more time, sister, please. Stop. She said money or possessions. Possessions come with the money. What else? Fame. Money comes with fame. Go ahead. Status. Usually we think we got money. That makes somebody special. There's a lot of people who couldn't care less about your dough. Trust me. But in our culture, money means something. Go ahead, sister. Aha, or whatever is valued more than the Lord, whatever it is, mammon. Because you read in the translation, you can't serve both God and mammon. We're like, who's mammon? Right? <laughs> well, we can get into that, but or whatever is valued more than the Lord, whatever is valued more than the Lord. Pastor, I was going to come to church today, but. The Bears game's on. You say, hey, Pastor, you are equating church and serving God, and that's not the same thing. Really? Yeah, well, you're saying I should be here. This is where I serve the Lord. This is where you serve the Lord. Jesus Christ established the local church. And here's the, can you only do it in a church? Of course not. We've had conversations with members of the church in the last few weeks regarding outreach something we need to do a better job of, and something we're planning to do a better job of. But serving God is the local church's responsibility. You come here to do it. It's not restricted to here, but most of us surely don't do it when we leave here. Amen? And you, when you say amen, that don't mean you're telling on yourself. So don't look at the person sitting next to you like, you don't? All right? You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot serve both God and the NFL or your career, your profession, you know, whether it's the police department or it's the fire department or whether you're a politician. Whatever it is, you cannot put that above God. God has to be first. Amen? How many of you have seen the movie Overcomer? All right? Not enough hands up, so I'm not going to even comment on it because I don't want to spoil it for you. Go see the movie. It's probably not at the movie theater anymore. But if you get a chance to see this movie, see this movie. It's about identity. When you know who you are, with your identity comes your purpose. We have a responsibility to serve God, folks. We have a responsibility to serve God. Look at verse, follow me down here. Verse, uh, Jesus talks about worrying in, in verse 25. Drop down with me to verse 32. He says, for the, he's talking about worrying. I, I almost cannot read it to you without going in context. He's talking about worrying about the things we wear, the things that we eat. Jesus says in verse 32, for the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things will be added to you as well. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day brings enough trouble of its own. Jesus says don't worry about things. Let God worry about things. Um, if you look at verse 29, I'll give it to you in uh, verse 28. I'll give it to you in, in a quick context. 
He says, you don't worry about your clothes. See the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't labor or spin. Verse 29, I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like these. Verse 30, if this is how God clothes the grass and the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow and thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? So don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about what you'll wear. You have little faith. Don't worry. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? He said, the pagans run after these things. They worry about these things. You have a father who loves you and will provide for you. Don't pursue these earthly treasures and store up these treasures. You know, they asked Rockefeller, how much is enough money? His response, just a few dollars more. A few is arbitrary. There's no number there. You say, hey, when I hit $100,000, when I hit a $1 million, I'll stop. A few more dollars. What's a few more? It's a few more is a few more. I heard a story of a man who once hung a sign in his gas station that said, free gas tomorrow. So you pull up and say, I'm here for the free gas. He says, yeah, that's tomorrow. And they say, yeah, but I saw the sign yesterday. He said, no, no, it's tomorrow. And the next day you come back, I'm here for the free gas. He says, that's tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. The treasures, the things that we're in pursuit of here on earth, I'm telling you, I promise you, at the end of the life, at the end of your life, the Bible says is futile. We're chasing after the wind. The only thing that's going to matter is what we've done that's going to impact eternity. So if we can't serve both God and money, we can't serve God and mammon, whatever else is to you, more important to you than God, God should have first place in your heart. My grandson was in here one of the days when we, had, uh, we, had, we didn't have the children's church in the back, and he heard the sermon. I put the sign, the T-shirt on him. Remember that? God first. And then he tells his mother. He says, hey, Mom, you know, I love you. He says, but you're number two. <laughs> I said, little guys, listen. And I hope he grasps that. I hope he truly understands that. More importantly, I pray he lives it. So how do we serve God in excellence? I'm glad you asked. First of all, we serve him through the local church. It is the local church that serves. It is our responsibility to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. But when you serve God, you serve him in a relationship. Amen? I've shared this last time, a couple of times I was uh, at a wedding. The last few people I've married, I've shared it, that when a man is in pursuit of his wife, the woman he wants to marry, his desire is to serve that woman. I'll bring you flowers, baby. I'll take you out to eat every weekend. Promise I'll never miss the anniversary date. You know, promise I'll whatever. Whatever you want, baby, the world is yours. Is that what we do, right? We pursue the woman. With no desire of anything in return, the only thing I ever really wanted from Tina was Tina. When I chased after Tina, what I desired from her was her. I wanted her. I didn't want what she could give me, what she could bring to the table. I didn't care. I just wanted her. Amen? The good, the bad, the ugly, I wanted it all. Whatever she had to offer, I wanted that. I didn't necessarily enter into this relationship to get something. I entered into it to give myself to her. Amen? This is something all of us should understand. If you've ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a wife, it's the same is true with God. When we enter into this relationship with God, we're not coming after God for what he can give us. When you enter into a relationship with God, you get God. Now let me ask you something. Do you think if you had a relationship, I mean, let's say you were in a, in a kingdom and there was a king, do you think that the relationship, your relationship with the king being a part-time relationship, hey, king, I'm going to submit to your, uh, you know, your kingdom rules Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But Monday through Wednesday, or Sunday through Wednesday, I'm going to do what the heck I want. Okay, king, I hope you're cool with that. How do you think that's going to roll? Your head's going to roll. That's what's going to roll. That's not going to happen in any kingdom. doesn't happen at your job, I guarantee it. You come into work, you say, hey, boss, I have a lieutenant at work. I can... My lieutenant looks at me sideways when I walk in late. Minute late, five minutes late. He doesn't care. You better be early. You can't be on time, be early, he says. So I walk in, he looks at you, <laughs> he looks at you sideways. Now, how am I going to tell my lieutenant, hey, uh, LT, I'm going to be on time on my first because I work four on two off. I'll be on time the first two days, but the second two, yeah, I'll get here when I get here. How do you think that's going to work? <laughs> think about it. Think about your, your relationship with your spouse. Hey, baby, I'm going to spend Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays with you, and the other days, hey, you do what you want, I do what I want. We'll hook back up for the Friday night dinner and movie thing. See you later, baby. See you Monday. 
heck no, this ain't going to work. You know that. So our relationship with God is established, or our serving God is established in the context of our relationship. Amen? That doesn't, those rules don't apply in the worldly relationships that we have with our spouse, with our children, with our bosses, with the king. Not going to happen. We have to commit to it. That's what marriage is. Marriage is a commitment. I'm going to marry you. I'm going to commit myself to you for the rest of our lives. There's going to be some days that ain't going to be easy, but I'm not going to tuck tail and run. I'm going to suck it up, pull myself up by my bootstraps, and we're going to push on. We're going to get through this stuff. That's what marriage is. I baptized a young lady here one day. She said, it's like a marriage. I said, indeed it is. You're entering into a committed relationship with your Savior. Amen? Amen. And with that comes responsibilities, and part of our responsibility is serving the, the, the king, the king of kings. When I was in the Army, I'll share the story with you in a minute. But we had a, uh, we had a motto. Whenever they called us to the position of attention, you had the sound off is what they call it. And when they got tired of hearing your motto, the, the sergeants would say, hey, when I call you to attention, silent. They didn't want to hear the motto because sometimes it was long and it was loud. And they had a headache. They didn't want to hear it. But typically when they called us to the position of attention, we chanted out this motto that our company lived by. Why would we do that? It was a reminder of who we was and what we were doing, and why. What I do know is this. The Bible says that we're selfish. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. If you could pull it up for me there, Robert. I just covered this last week. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, by the mercies of God, I beseech you, my brothers. I'm begging you. I'm crying out to you. I'm asking you to present yourself as a living sacrifice in view of God's mercies, of all that God has done for you. Has God been good to you, church? Amen. amen. Can I hear that again? If God has been good to you, can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Give my hand if he's been good to you. God has been so good to me, so good to me, and he still is. Many times that my hard head itself don't deserve the blessings of God, he pours out on me anyway. And because of his mercies, the Bible says I should present my body as a living sacrifice. Brother Bob read an extraordinary translation last week about presenting all of your members, your fingers, your eyes, your ears, your toes, every part of your body, everything you have, you should present that as a living sacrifice to God, holy and pleasing to God. This is a spiritual act of worship. This is a reasonable act of service, other translations say. This is my, Jose Burgos' reasonable act of service to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords who's done so much for me. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills also. God owns everything. He wants everything. He has everything. God has it all except your heart. That's what he wants more than anything is your heart. And the only reason why he doesn't take it is because he would encroach on your free will. I was just sharing with Tina. It was a movie with Jim Carrey, Bruce Almighty. How many of you have seen it? Some people are appalled by it because it's sacrilegious and it just makes fun of God. It does not, not in my opinion. But there's a part in the movie where Jim Carrey is endowed with the powers of God, and he has two rules. One, he cannot tell anyone he's God. Morgan Freeman's God takes a vacation, right, in the movie. And so Morgan Freeman gives all of the powers to Jim Carrey, and he tells Jim Carrey, I was going to show a clip, but I learned my lesson. But uh, he tells Jim Carrey, you can't tell anyone you're God, and you can't fool with free will. Well, there's a part in the movie where Jim Carrey's reaching out to his girlfriend, Jennifer Aniston, who's mad at him. She's walking away. Her name's Grace, by the way. Interesting. And he, she's walking away from him, and he jumps up like onto a park bench <laughs> in typical Jim Carrey fashion. He's just such a buffoon. He's like, love me. And he's trying to use his godly powers. And he's telling Jennifer Aniston, she's walking away, he goes, love me. He's doing the Jim Carrey thing. You know, it's funny, it's funny, it's hilarious. But it's a pivotal moment in the movie where you, think, where you connect to spirituality. Right. She turns around and tells him, I did. I did love you. You blew it. And she turns around and walks away from him. And that moment, he realizes he can't make her love him. That's a choice that she makes. It's a choice that you make. It's a choice that I make. And he's endowed with the powers of God. And he can't make her love him. And I picture Jim Carrey doing this. 
pictured my father in heaven. Same, same thing. Oh, hey, I give you so much. What more do I got to do? I'm pouring all out. And all I want is your 100% devotion in return. Why can't you just love me? It depends on my mood. Depends if it's football season or not. Depends how much money I have, how much time I got. Are you kidding me? It is a reasonable act of worship. It's the least we could do. Talked to you last week about being the living sacrifice. The problem with that is that the living sacrifice crawls off the altar. I asked Anthony to read the definition of sacrifice. He says slaughtering, the act of slaughtering an animal. We have to slaughter ourselves. We have to kill ourselves. We have to die to ourselves every day. Deny yourself. Take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. That's how you serve him. You're like, Pastor, I don't know about all that. I don't know if I can do that. The Bible says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You can do it. You don't want to. Well, I do want to. I just can't. The Bible says you can through Christ who gives you strength. I told you when I was in the Army, we had a model. I went through the Army. I joined the Army in 1989. I can't believe I'm 48 on Tuesday. I'm 48 years old. So I joined the Army 31 years ago. Holy cow. But when I was a 17-year-old knucklehead kid, they would call us to the position of attention. And there's, a, there's 200 of us in our, our battalion, uh, Bravo 795th MP Battalion. They call us to attention. Everybody feel Wah! together. Sound cool. You have to practice that until everyone gets it right or you're doing push-ups. When they call you to the position of attention, they say, you know, uh, company. They're calling, talking to our company, the Bravo Company, B Company. They call you to attention. You're standing at a parade rest, and everybody pops their feet together and hands on the side, and it makes a big Wah! Sounds really cool. 200 people doing it at the same time. But my platoon was about 50 guys. And there was four platoons, so there was 200 guys. We had our own model. But the company model, I still remember both the models 31 years later. How do you figure I know that? They called us to the position of attention, and this is what we said. This is important. Motivated, dedicated. Leave me alone. Forget the meat, just throw me the bone. We're Bravo, B Company Bulldogs. That was the model, that was the mascot. Bravo Bulldog 795, that was the battalion, committed to excellence, and that's no jive. We walk straight, talk straight, dress right, dress. Wings with a big, <gasps> 200 guys, actually 50, yeah, 200 guys sounding off. And you say, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Motivated. Christian, sometimes you wake up in the morning, you lack motivation to be a Christian. Dedicated. Are you dedicated and consecrated to the Lord? Leave me alone, the world, Satan. Forget the meat. I wouldn't say that, but throw me the bone. In this case, use your Bible. Right? Committed, committed to excellence? Are we? Or is the Sunday morning good enough? Forget Tuesday nights, you know, maybe the woman's study every now and then, and maybe the band of brothers if I feel like doing whatever they're doing. Maybe I feel like going out to an outreach event. Maybe I don't. Picnic, I may bring something, I might not. Is that committed? Committed to excellence. That's no jive. What's the word jive mean? Anybody know? The jive, when you say, when you tell somebody, hey, man, I'm jiving you, what's that mean, Rob? Rob taught me this word, I believe, when I watched the movie back in the day where they talk about jive talking. You're just, you're just joking. You're kidding. You're messing around. I tell Rob, dude. The bear's one. And he's like, are you serious? I'm like, no, I'm jiving. <laughs> it's jiving. You're joking around. You're, you're, you're clowning. You ain't serious. Don't take me. I'm just jiving. We are committed to excellence, and that's just not lip service. No jive. It's the truth. We're committed to excellence. That's no jive. So here's the model that we're called to, the position of attention. We as soldiers will come together motivated, dedicated, leave me alone, forget the meat. Throw me the bone. We're Bravo Bulldogs, 795, committed to excellence. That's no jive. So here's the quote. We walk straight, we talk straight, and dress right dress. Ooh. What do we take from that from a spiritual perspective? Motivation, dedication, committed to excellence. Walking straight means living in a manner worthy of your calling. Talking means watch the things you say, who you say them to. 
be, be, we're building our character. Absolutely. Watch what we say. We, we live our life like there's no consequence for the, what, the things we say and do. There is. So here's a song for you. Here is my motto for our church. James, could you pull the lyrics to the song, Purify My Heart? What are we talking about, church? What am I talking about? I'm talking about serving. Serving God, right? How do we serve God? Half-heartedly doesn't work. It's not going to cut it. It wouldn't work at your job. It doesn't work in your marriage, and it's not going to work with God. Serving God in excellence, giving him your best. He deserves your best. He's given you his best, his son, his spirit. This song says, purify my heart. This is a song. Listen, I told you, motivated, dedicated, leave me alone, forget the meat. Throw me the bone. We're Bravo Bulldog, 795, committed to excellence. That's no jive. We walk straight, talk straight, dress right, dress. Oh! Every time they called us to attention was probably 20 times a day. Reminding us of who we are, why we're here. Don't mess around. Mean what you say. Say what you mean. This song, Purify My Heart, is a song that I sung in my heart over and over and over and over again. This is how it goes. It says, Purify My Heart. I'm going to sing it to you, actually. Oh, Lord, I want to know you. Purify my life and make it holy thine. Purify my thoughts and keep me in your presence. Oh, Lord, abiding in the vine. You got the next verse? It says, abiding in you, that's all I want to do. That your spirit might flow through me. A living sacrifice, I lay down my life. Oh, Lord, that you might use me. You hear this song? Man, every hair on my body stands up when we sing this song. Go back to the purify my heart. Purify my heart, you're asking. I went to the motto. The motto, motivated, dedicated, leave me alone, reminding us soldiers who you are, why you're here, and what we've come to do. This song says purify my heart. There's a lot of garbage in there, church family, that God needs to purify. So the cry of your heart is, purify my heart, O oh Lord, I want to know you. The implication is if that garbage is in there, there's only so much knowing God you're going to be able to get. The other stuff is in the way. Purify my life, Lord, and make it all yours, holy thine. Purify my thoughts, the battlefield is in the mind, remember? And keep me in your very presence, Lord. We talked about this in Sunday school. The presence of God brings revival. O oh Lord, I want abiding in the vine. We're going to go to John chapter 15 in just a minute. Go to the, to the next verse, James. Abiding in you, Lord, that's what I want to do. Why? So that your spirit might flow through me. That's why. A living sacrifice. Right? This is where I'm living my life for you, God. I lay down my life. I'm laying it down for you, Lord. Why? So you might be able to use me. God can't use you when we won't let him. We can't get out of our own way. You know why? Because our thoughts, our minds, our heart are all polluted. This song should be the motto of every Christian. Purify my heart, O oh Lord, I want to know you. Purify my thoughts and make them, or my life and make it holy thine. Purify my thoughts and keep me in your presence, O oh Lord. Help me to abide in the vine. Committed to excellence. That's no jive. The average Christian. We say we're committed to the Lord. Turn with me to John chapter 15. Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord is what God has called us to do. The scripture reads, I am the vine. This is Jesus. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be more fruitful. 
purify my heart, right? It says, I lay down my life, O Lord, that you might use me. Abiding in the vine. You're already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you, Jesus says. Remain in me. Remain in me. And I'll remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I brought in a tree branch when I preached in the book of John. When I preached through the Gospels and I showed you a dead tree branch and showed you how many fruit can grow on that branch, the answer would be zero. Many of us are like the branch. We separate from the tree and we think that we can bear fruit. The Bible says without me you can do nothing. He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. The man remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, it's like the branch is thrown away and withers. Hear that? Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. You wonder why your prayers are, power, are powerless or seem powerless? The Bible says to remain in me. Verse 7, if you remain in me and my word, Jesus says, remains in you, ask for whatever you want and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you will bear fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father's loved me, so I've loved you, so remain in my love. Verse 10, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, so that you, your joy may be uh, each of other as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that I lay down his life for his friends. You are now my friends. I want you to see this here. Jesus is talking about abiding in him. Go back to the song, James. Purify my heart. Abide in me, Jesus said, and I'll abide in you. If you abide in me and my word abides in you, you can ask for whatever you want, and it will be given to you. Purify my heart, O oh Lord, I want to know you. Purify my heart and make it wholly thine. Purify my thoughts and make it wholly thine. Purify my thoughts and keep me in your presence, O oh Lord, I want to abide in the vine. Do you? Or is this just jive talking? Do you really want to abide in the vine? Oh, you're just kidding. We need to mean what we say and say what's mean. Another quick story. When I was in the Army. Uh, I, before I joined the Army, I had, a, uh, I had a newspaper route. I had an old man. I'll never forget him. His name was Mr. Batruff. B-O-T-R-U-F-F. -F. He was old. And I, I knocked on his door to go collect the money. I was telling him I'm leaving for the army. And he said, hey, nice time to join. Hasn't been a war in 45 years. <laughs> so I joined the army. Take advantage of the benefits. He was real proud of me and everything. I had my paper out for like six years. So I had a relationship with my customers. And he goes, uh, good luck to you, whatever. And so I leave. And I'll never forget, I didn't even out of basic training. We invaded Panama. We had Panama, Somalia, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. <laughs> it was just like one conflict after another. And I remember his words. Hadn't been a conflict in 45 years. Thanks, Mr. Batruff, you jinxed me. But uh, anyway, what I remember was this. I joined because there hasn't been a conflict in 45 years. I joined for the GI Bill. I joined for the VA loan. I joined for all of the benefits that come with it. You get to see the world. I joined for all of those reasons. I didn't join to kill somebody. That's not why I became a soldier. I joined the military for the benefits that came with it. And here we are. I'm 17 now. So I'm still a clown. Okay, you, so, so show me a little grace. <laughs> So we're in the pugil pit. The pugil pit, you got these big giant Q-tips, big old cushions on each side, and you're wearing football helmets, and you're trying to beat the tar out of each other. It's a practice for the bayonet, or the butt stroke of the rifle with the slash of the rifle with the bayonet. That's what it is, bayonet training. We're in the pugil pit. We're beating the tar out of each other, and you're kicking like this sawdust. It's pretty cool. For a 17-year-old kid, man, it's cool. So there's a guy, they're teaching us how to fight. Now, I don't know about you, but unless you have extensive lessons in fighting, all that's going to go out the window when a real fight kicks in. You're going to resort to whatever comes natural, <laughs> whatever it is. Okay, but they're teaching this stuff, and I'm like, really, you're going to give me a, a, a four-hour class on how to fight? Come on, dude. I'm going back to the streets. When, when, when push comes to shove, I'm looking for a branch or something to hit you with. I'm not going to remember that stuff you taught me. Just not. Unless it's extensive training, you will forget. So I'm not taking it serious. 17 years old. The dude in front of me, <laughs> they're, they're teaching us this front snap kick. The, the, the guy who's teaching the class, he's like, bring your knee up, straight up, straight out. Ha! Pa! And I'm like, this is so stupid, man. I was like, really? We're doing like 100 times. Well, one time when I kicked my foot up, I accidentally inadvertently kicked sawdust on the back of the head of the dude in front of me. And he goes, and he keeps practicing his kick. And I start laughing. 
when I realized he's got sawdust in his head. So the second one wasn't an accident. Neither was the third, fourth, the fifth, and sixth one. And now I got the guy next to me. We're kicking sawdust, and we're laughing. We're just having a good old time. And one guy tells me, he goes, hey. He, goes, he says, knock it off, man. This is serious. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, this is serious. You never know when it's still might save your life someday. And I'm like, man, shut up. I'm like, get out of here, dude. You know, we're, we're dumb kids. I'm 17. I'm like, man, whatever, dude. And I told him, ain't been a war in 45 years. We didn't make it out of basic training, and then the, we invaded Panama. And I was like, oh, shoot. Now I'm thinking, I wish I took that, that stuff a little more serious. Maybe I might have learned something. Maybe I could have put it in my repertoire. Maybe I could have learned something. Maybe I could, maybe I could use it. My point is, most Christians, that's how we live our life. We come to church, and we're just kind of kicking sawdust. We're laughing, having a good time, not realizing the stuff you're learning may save your life. But we're not committed to excellence. We're content with mediocrity. So why should we serve? Well, Jesus said the Son of Man didn't come to serve but to be served. Didn't come to be served but come to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. You want to be like Jesus? Jesus served. I may be sitting here today, like, Pastor, man, I don't know about the serving thing, man. I don't know about that. I'm going to tell you this. We got a nursery in the back. You may think, well, I don't have kids. Tina, I was reading this article. Tina and I were having a conversation about serving in a nursery, why you should, even if you don't have kids. How it's a blessing to other people. It's not babysitting. There's a jam, junior jam. Maybe you're like, I'm not a teacher. Well, you can help. Trust me, there's plenty to do. Plenty. You need to find an area to serve the Lord here in the local church and outside the church. Inside is called the ministry. Outside is called the mission. We have a responsibility. We've been called to serve. But the average Christian is content with mediocrity. They're content with sitting on their hands and being served. But if you want to grow in Christ's likeness, you want to be like Jesus Christ, Jesus said the Son of Man didn't come to be served. He came to serve. Turn with me to Joshua 24, and I'll close here. So you say, you know what, Pastor, it's hard. I know it's hard, but the Bible says you can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives you strength. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Then the Bible says that we should transform our minds, right? We should change our minds, the way we think, the way we act. Um, when I was in the Army, they transformed my mind. The way I knew, the way I thought, the way I act, everything changed. And when I came out of the army, I had to be deprogrammed because I was a soldier and I was frustrated with the lack of urgency in the average uh, civilian's life. I'd sit down to eat, inhale my food, 30 seconds. Tina looked at me, she's still cutting her steak. She's looking at me like, really, dude? You're embarrassing me in front of my family. You eat like you're starving. You know why? Because in the army, you eat with a purpose. Sit down, eat your food, and get out. We got stuff to do. I had to be reprogrammed. The way I was trying to raise my kids, I was crazy. I was like a drill sergeant. Hey, sit down. Tina's like, dude, you're not just soldiers, man, relax. I was just programmed. We've been indoctrinated as a culture. Somebody told me the other day, they said, hey, you know how the WWF is scripted? I said, yeah. How many of you guys knew that? I don't want to ruin it for you. The WWE is a scripted sport. When it was the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation, they were a sport. The championship was a legitimate heavyweight champ of the world, and if you said it was scripted or fake, they'd get bent out of shape. Well, when they changed from WWF, the Federation, to the WWE, which is entertainment, they embraced the, the script. Hey, it's a big soap opera, guys. You know, we're just beating people up. It's a show. Just like you would go see John Wick. John Wick ain't real. Did you know that? <laughs> I right, just let you know. So when you go to see a movie, you're like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. It's not real. And the WWE said, hey, we're entertainers. We're here to entertain you. Cool. Everybody got that out the way. Now we can enjoy wrestling, right? Somebody told me at work the other day, they said, hey, what if the NFL was the same way? I said, hey, what do you mean? We already know who's going to win. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's a contest. He says who? I said, there's too many people who know, and, they, you know, and this person's like, hey, what if? What if everything we've been taught, I mean, and I'm, I'm starting to think outside the box. I don't believe that's true, but it's an interesting analogy. Everybody knows it's scripted. This person's supposed to miss the block. This person's supposed to get hurt. They're supposed to throw the interception. What if? I thought, wow, I never thought about that. I can't, I can't accept that. You know why? Because my mind is set. 
that the NFL is a game and it's a contest because I've been watching college, I've been watching Pop Warner, I've been watching high school all my life. I refuse to accept that. Is it possible? Sure, I suppose. Non-disclosure agreements and stuff like that. We wouldn't have this debate. And we're going back and forth, round and round. I'm like, man, I just can't accept that. Why? Because I don't want to accept the fact that football is fake. What if it was? person tells me, next time you sit down and watch the game, think about that. Like you would watch WWE. Think about that. What if, you know, it's already scripted and winners are already, I'm like, still like, hate to pop your NFL ball. Well, you didn't because I don't believe that's true. But the point is, the way we think, we've been indoctrinated. Uh, and so you may be sitting here today saying, Pastor, I don't want to serve. Nothing desirable comes to me from serving other people. I have no desire to do that. Okay. This is in the book of Joshua. The Bible says, Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, the leaders, judges, officials to is of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your forefathers, including Terah, the, the father of Abraham, and Nahor, lived beyond the river and worshipped other gods. This is God talking. Verse 3. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the river, and I led him through Canaan and gave him, gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac. Verse 4. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I signed the hill uh, country of Seir to Esau and Jacob, and to his sons went down to Egypt. 5. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did what I did there, and I brought you out. Verse 6, God's talking about a whole lot of stuff that has transpired before these guys. <laughs> we live in a blessed nation, folks. It's a whole lot of stuff that's transpired before us. When I brought your forefathers out of Egypt, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. Verse 7, remember, don't forget, but they cried to the Lord for help, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Go back to verse 7, please. He brought the sea over and them and covered them, and you saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians when you lived in the desert for a long time. You saw it, God says. You've seen what I've done, verse 8. But I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. The victory against the Amorites came because I gave them to you, God says. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. Verse 9. God's saying, look what I've done. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. In light of God's mercies in your life, of all of the blessings God has given you, don't forget. Present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's a reasonable act of service. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. Verse 10. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. God says, once again, I come through because I'm faithful. Amen? Amen. Verse 11. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, the Preserites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. All of these people come up against you, all of them. But I gave them all up into your hands, all of them. God says, I laid the smack down. All of them. Look at that, that's a mouthful. All of these folks come up against you, God says, and I, I protected you. I handed them all over to you. Verse 12. I want you to think about the giants in your life, the calamities, the, the, the struggles that God has brought you through. Those are your Canaanites, your Perizzites, your Hivites. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, two Amorite kings, you did not. Do it with your own sword and bow, says God. You didn't do this. I did it. I used you, but I did it. You think you pulled yourself up out of poverty? Maybe you grew up and you didn't have jack. And maybe you're living in a pretty good lifestyle right now. You didn't do that. God did it. God allowed you to get to where you're at. But it is the blessings of God that he's poured out into your life. I saw Hugh Jackman in concert the other night. He said there was a time in his life when he couldn't only afford the back two rows. That's it. Look at him today. He didn't say it, but he alluded to the fact that he was grateful in his life to something else. I presume God. 
He never said it, though. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you. Also, Amorite kings, you did not do it with your own sword and your own bow. Verse 13. So I gave you a land. Look, listen to this. This is where I find myself, church. This is where Jose Burgos finds himself. I don't deserve God's mercies. I don't deserve his blessings in my life. So God says, I gave you a land on which you did not toil. Cities you did not build. And you live in and you eat from vineyards and olive groves that you surely didn't plant. I said, I did this for you. God is good. Verse 14. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. All he's asking for in return. Throw away the gods of your forefathers. They worshiped beyond the rivers and in Egypt. Throw all that garbage away and serve me. That's all he's asking for. Then he leaves you with a choice in verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose today. Choose yourself. God's giving you a choice. Choose yourself today whom you're going to serve. Would it be the gods of your forefathers that served beyond the rivers or the gods of the Amorites in those lands that you are now living? But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Church family, I'm telling you, we have been called to serve God. We have a responsibility in serving him. And if that seems undesirable to you, choose. Choose today. Who are you going to serve? You can't serve both God and man. Whatever that is that you put more value on over God, you can't serve them both. You will love one and despise the other, or you'll hate one and love the other. It's just what the scripture teaches. You cannot have allegiance to two masters. You just can't. I'm going to ask you to play some music for me, James, as we move into our response time. If you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Pastor, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know about this service. You let me know. I'd be more than happy to pray with you and for you. If you're here today and you say, I do want to serve. I want to serve more. I want to serve better. I want to encourage you. I want you to step up and into the challenge that God has placed before us to live a life worthy of the calling that he's placed in our life. We have a responsibility to serve. Once again, if you don't want to serve him, choose for yourself who you'll serve. But if you're going to serve him, the scripture says serve him faithfully.